Welcome to another fun-filled episode of Pathology, brought to you by your friendly neighborhood pathologist, Dr. Jennifer Gordetsky. Today, we will be going over bladder pathology. And for this special lecture, I bring you Vesque Intelligite. We're doing it Hogwarts style, people. So here we go. This is what we'll be discussing in this lecture. We will go over the normal anatomy and histology of the bladder. We'll talk about some congenital stuff. We will then move on to the benign bladder, which includes things such as malacoplakia, cystosomiasis, and nephrogenic adenoma. And then finally, we will move on to the malignant bladder and include in that the precursor lesions and invasive urothelial carcinoma. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the uh, female urinary bladder anatomy. So here we have our bladder we have the ureters coming in here and we have our detrusor muscle and that's a very important muscle because that's the muscle that is going to contract to allow our bladder to empty um, we also have the internal and external urethral sphincters which are important in maintaining uh, urinary continence now notice here that the uh, female urethra is very short compared to the male urethra and because of that um, it is uh, puts women at increased risk of acquiring uh, bacterial uh, urinary tract infections. Now, when you have uh, normal voiding, uh, urine is coming from the ureters and enters the bladder. The bladder is very compliant. It's going to fill uh, with very low pressure, which is important because you don't want there to be a lot of pressure inside the bladder because if there is, that would put pressure back up the urinary tract to the upper tract to the kidney and could cause renal damage. And it's the same idea with voiding. You want the bladder to be able to empty itself under low pressure because, again, you don't want that pressure being put on the kidneys. So when the bladder empties itself, the detrusor muscle is going to contract. And at, at the same time, the um, urethral sphincters are going to relax. And so this is a coordinated effort that allows urine to exit the bladder under low pressure. Now, when everything is working appropriately, um, we are able to uh, hold our urine when we want to and release our urine when we are ready to and in the appropriate place, like the bathroom. Um, but uh, some patients have troubles um, with continence. And um, there are two types of continence, or incontinence, I should say. There's a stress urinary incontinence and urge urinary incontinence. So um, let me give you an example. Uh, when I was in medical school, one of my friends had recently had a baby, and she uh, came up to me and said, uh, you know, she knew I was going to urology, and she said, you know, um, I had a question. Uh, uh, you know, ever since I had my baby, every time I cough or sneeze, I leak a little urine. And she said, what do you, what do you think's uh, going on there? And I said, oh, it, that sounds like stress urinary incontinence. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. I know that diagnosis, and uh, you know, I'm like, yes. Uh, and she says to me. You know, I, you know, I, I don't feel really stressed. So awkward silence ensued. So, you know, it made me realize that uh, stress urinary incontinence is perhaps not the best term. By stress, we mean pressure. Okay, so um, Hedwig is going to fly in here to help demonstrate intra-abdominal pressure. So when we cough or sneeze, the amount of pressure that is inside the abdomen that is getting pushed upon the bladder goes up. And if our urethral sphincter is not able to keep up, then that means we're going to leak urine. And notice the location of the uterus. So as that uterus grows a baby, uh, that's going to put pressure on the bladder. Again, putting uh, you at risk for stress urinary incontinence. That's different from urge urinary incontinence. Urge urinary incontinence is basically the detrusor muscle being overactive. It's constantly contracting. So like every few minutes you think, oh, I've got to pee. Uh, 
Oh, I've got to pee. And then if you don't make it to the bathroom in time, that's uh, urge urinary incontinence. Okay, so let's turn our attention to the pelvic diaphragm of the female. Um, I think the most important uh, uh, muscle uh, to focus on is the uh, ani levator muscle. And why is this uh, important? Because this muscle helps support pelvic organs. So um, if you have injury to the ani levator uh, muscle, that can cause pelvic organ prolapse. So for example, um, when you undergo uh, vaginal delivery, uh, that will cause stretch injury to the pelvic diaphragm muscles. How much injury? It is 200 times more than the threshold for a stretch injury. And I can tell you, as a mother of three children, I found that news really distressing. Regardless, it is important to remember that the ani levator muscle levates and supports the pelvic organs. And when things are not levated, they can fall out. Okay, let's talk a little bit about male reproductive anatomy. Now, first of all, I'd like to point out where the prostate is in relationship to the bladder. This is possibly the most poorly designed organ in the human body. I mean, I'm not passing judgment. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. So the prostate gland surrounds the urethra. And so as the prostate gets bigger, you can imagine that is then going to cause a lot of uh, pressure on the urethra and cause it to collapse. And that's going to cause obstruction, right? Because you're going to basically have this big lump that's preventing uh, urine from uh, getting out. Because remember, the detrusor muscle, muscle contracts, the external uh, urethral sphincter relaxes. Meanwhile, you have this gigantic prostate in the way that's preventing the flow of urine. And uh, as long as you are alive, the prostate gland will continue to grow. Hence, not a great idea. So um, this is also kind of tells you why uh, it's more common for women to have stress urinary incontinence than men. Why? Because as you have increased pressure on the bladder, uh, the uh, prostate is basically uh, this big ball in the way that's also uh, helping keep urine in along with the external urethral sphincter. Um, so. Uh, that is why, uh, so it's kind of helpful in, uh, in, in maintaining continence, but, uh, you know, too much of a good thing is bad. And when you start uh, getting obstruction, then that can cause issues. The next thing I'd like to point out is the Viru Montanum and uh, the location. Uh, this is actually a very important location uh, in a procedure called transurethral resection of the prostate. Uh, and what happens is you take a scope, you go up through the urethra, and you actually carve out uh, the prostate tissue that's obstructing the flow of urine. It's a very common um, procedure. And you, what you do is you use the Viru Montanum or the ejaculatory duct as a landmark because notice that distal to that is your external urethral sphincter. And again, when you're carving out the prostate, you don't want to cut through the sphincter because that's going to cause urinary incontinence. Another thing that uh, is important is just the uh, location of the pubic symphysis, right? Um, notice that this bone is sitting right on top of uh, the urethra. And this explains why in um, pelvic fractures and straddle injuries, it's so common to have um, urethral damage because what happens is that this bone comes crushing down on the urethra uh, in the area of the bulbomembranous urethra and um, that can cause a tear uh, in the urethra and sometimes it, it transects the entire uh, thing. Um, finally, I just want to point out uh, the vas deferens uh, and the um, uh, seminal vesicle 
uh, in relationship to the prostate. So when you do a radical prostatectomy and you take out the prostate, that means you're also removing the seminal vesicle and you're cutting through uh, the vas deferens, right? Because these structures all join up to eventually empty into the ejaculatory duct. And so what does that mean uh, for men who've had a prostatectomy? It means that although they may be able to experience orgasm, they are not going to produce an ejaculate, meaning that uh, there is not going to be any sperm uh, going out of the urethra. And so men who have um, had a prostatectomy uh, are then infertile, uh, at least from your, uh, unless they want to do, uh, you know, IVF or, or ICSI. In terms of uh, male anatomy, the other thing that I, I think is very important is just uh, understanding uh, the uh, location of um, the spermatic cord and how it's going through um, the inguinal ring here. Um, so remember, when you have hernia repairs, that's all happening in this area. And the vas deferens is going right through there. And so you can see how, one complication of a hernia repair could potentially be uh, accidentally transecting the vas deferens or causing um, enough fibrosis um, or uh, injury uh, to the vas deferens, uh, which could potentially uh, cause infertility, especially in patients who have had bilateral inguinal hernia repairs. Yep, that's pretty gross. This is what uh, a bladder and prostate look like once they've been removed from the body. And um, what's with all the black stuff uh, and yellow stuff? Well, that's ink. Um, and we do that uh, for margins. So that's so that when we look at the tissue under the microscope, if we see tumor touching ink, then we know that there's a positive margin. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, uh, this big lump over here that is now deflated, that's all the bladder. This little round circle here is the prostate. And you can see that there's a probe that is uh, entering uh, the prostatic urethra. Uh, so this is a nicer prettier picture of what we're seeing. So um, again, uh, you can see the relationship of the bladder uh, to the prostate. And this particular surgery is done uh, for bladder cancer. You have to remove both the bladder uh, and the prostate uh, in that surgery. Now this is what the bladder looks like uh, after it's been opened. And um, we have uh, used the uh, sword of um, Godric Gryffindor uh, to open the bladder um, along the prostatic urethra. And so you can see that the yellow arrow here, this is your prostatic urethra. This is pieces of your prostate that have now been um, cut in half. Um, here we have the uh, trigone of the bladder, and these probes are actually entering the ure ureteral orifices, so the openings of the ureter. So you can see this tiny little hole there and a little hole there. Um, now up here, this is our tumor. You can see this is a um, ulcerative uh, mass um, that is uh, in the wall of the bladder. All right, let's uh, talk about the normal histology of the bladder. We have three layers. We have the urethelium on top. That's the epithelium of the uh, inside of the bladder. Uh, we then have the lamina propria. And finally, uh, deep, we have the large muscle bundles of the muscularis propria, which is also uh, the detrusor muscle. Uh, now you might wonder um, what a um, phoenix uh, has to do with the normal bladder. Well, the phoenix is a uh, mythological creature. It's a firebird, and uh, you know when it dies, it's uh, reborn from its own ashes. And the bladder is a low-pressure voiding system. So there you go. Here we have a closer look at the histology of the urethelium, and you can see that the um, cells that make up uh, the urethelium uh, line up quite nicely. Uh, they're 
Their the nuclei are round and cylindrical, and uh, they line up just like a picket fence or like you might see in the gates uh, of Hogwarts. Now on the top are um, these round uh, nuclei with prominent nucleoli and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and those are your umbrella cells. So it's important to remember that not all muscle in the bladder is the same. You can have these thin, wispy muscle uh, bundles up in the lamina propria, and that is the muscularis mucosae, as opposed to the muscularis propria, which are the larger, thicker muscles of the detrusor muscle. Um, muscularis propria, think of it as the proper muscle of the bladder. That's the muscle that's going to be uh, contracting uh, when you want to void. So again, we have muscularis mucosae, which is in the lamina propria, that are very uh, thin, wispy muscle bundles. Meanwhile, the muscularis propria has these big, round, thick uh, muscle bundles that kind of look like the uh, trunk of the whomping willow. Why is this important? Because uh, in terms of uh, bladder cancer, if tumor involves the lamina propria, well, then they just get intravesical BCG therapy. However, if tumor is involving the muscularis propria, then that means that it's in the detrusor muscle and that patient needs to have their bladder surgically removed. So uh, diagnosing that incorrectly is bad. Another common normal histologic finding that you will see in the bladder is something called von Brun's nest, which is basically just a downward growth of urethelium in the lamina propria. And they make these cute little nested urethelial balls that you can see here that are just, they're in the lamina propria and they're just underneath the surface of the urethelium, which is here. Okay, let's move on to some common congenital entities that could be high yield. Um, and yes, I realize that the scar that Harry Potter has is actually acquired and not congenital, but I needed a picture of a baby. Gosh, everyone's a critic. Vesicourethral reflux uh, is the most common bladder congenital anomaly. And what happens is when the uh, bladder contracts, instead of all the urine going out the urethra, you actually have uh, reflux of urine up the ureter and sometimes all the way up into the kidneys. And you can uh, see in this image here uh, showing the degree of reflux uh, from grade one where it's only going into the ureter all the way up to severe cases where uh, <clears throat> not only is it going up the ureter, it's going into the kidney and causing hydronephrosis of the kidney um, and destruction of the renal cortical tissue. Um, this is um, uh, problematic because um, you can have a scarring and, and loss of renal function in severe cases, um, but even in cases where the urine is just going up um, the ureter, that's gonna cause stasis of urine, which can lead to infection, such as urinary uh, tract infections and um, pyelonephritis in severe cases. Bladder diverticula can be either congenital, however, most of them are acquired. And what is happening is you're having the um, bladder uh, urethelium and lamina propria uh, protruding out of the muscularis propria of the bladder wall. Um, most of the time, this is caused from long-term um, obstruction and most commonly from um, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So as the prostate gets larger and causes outlet obstruction, the pressure in the bladder increases. Well, instead of that pressure going up the ureter and harming the kidneys, uh, the bladder uh, basically makes itself bigger. So you have these um, 
pouch-like uh, areas of bladder that are protruding out of the wall, and that's going to give um, the bladder a little bit uh, more filling uh, capacity and decrease um, the pressure. However, this is also going to cause uh, urinary stasis, which can lead to infection, uh, bladder stones, uh, and even tumors. Bladder extrophy is a severe um, congenital anomaly uh, caused by a developmental failure in the anterior abdominal wall. And basically what you have is the uh, bladder lying open and exposed uh, on the uh, anterior abdominal wall, as well as an uh, incompletely com uh, formed uh, penis and epispadius. So you see the opening of the urethra on the dorsal surface. Now this requires surgical correction uh, in infancy. And if it's uh, not uh, corrected, uh, the patient will have um, urinary incontinence, uh, but also because that bladder mucosa is chronically exposed to the outside world, uh, that's going to cause a chronic irritation, uh, which will increase the risk of bladder cancer. So if you remember back to embryology, you'll remember that there uh, used to be uh, a connection between the dome of the bladder and the umbilicus, uh, which was the uracus. Now the uracus um, is obliterated after birth, and uh, that is why we don't leak urine out of our belly buttons. However, uh, occasionally uh, it is not completely obliterated, and that can lead to uracal cysts, uracal sinuses, uh, or uh, uracal fistulas, where you will have urine tracking from the bladder uh, through the uracus uh, and out the umbilicus. Um, now, the lining of the uh, remnants of um, the uracus uh, can be urethelial, and many times it's uh, glandular. And um, tumors, especially adenocarcinomas, can arise from uracal remnants, and those tumors are found at the dome of the bladder. Okay, moving on to the benign bladder. Again, this is a gross photograph of the uh, bladder that has been opened anteriorly along uh, the urethra. So urethra here, trigone, ureteral orifices where probes are going through, and then the rest of the normal bladder is here. Our first stop in the benign bladder includes reactive changes, uh, which can be caused by inflammation and can lead to metaplasia. What is metaplasia? Well, it's when one epithelium turns into another. Let's talk about a cystitis, uh, which is uh, inflammation of the bladder. Uh, here we have chronic uh, cystitis, which means the inflammation has been going on for a long time. And you can see that there are lymphocytes up here in the urethelium. Those are those uh, tiny little blue dots. Uh, and you can also see down in the lamina propria uh, the occasional uh, plasma cell. Now, you can also have acute uh, cystitis, and that is um, seen by the presence of neutrophils, which kind of look like ants crawling through the urethelium. Um, cystitis can most commonly is caused uh, by a bacterial infection, um, the most common organisms being E. coli and proteus. Um, and that can uh, be caused by uh, stones, urinary stasis, and patients who have diabetes are more at risk uh, for cystitis. Uh, when you have a cystitis, that can uh, spread uh, retrograde to the kidney, uh, causing a pyelonephritis. Um, there is also uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, uh, which the bladder gets uh, so inflamed and irritated uh, that you have sloughing of the urethelium and um, hemorrhage um, of the underlying uh, tissues. And that can be caused by uh, things such as viral infections, especially adenovirus, as well as um, some drugs such as uh, cyclophosphamide.
Cystitis cystica and cystitis glandularis are almost always seen together. Uh, these are benign changes that occur within von Brunn's nest. Cystitis cystica is just a cystic dilation of the von Brunn's nest. Uh, you can see that uh, here. Uh, while cystitis glandularis is actually a metaplastic process uh, where you start seeing uh, changes, glandular type changes, uh, which can be seen by the apical uh, mucin um, uh, within uh, the von Brunn's nests. And many times uh, we just call it cystitis cystica et glandularis because they're seen together. This is just a closer view of that metaplastic process, uh, cystitis glandularis. So you can see the normal urethelium here where the nuclei are nicely lined up like that picket fence. And then suddenly we have more columnar cells with apical mucin. And you can see that this is a, a glandular uh, type change. You can also have intestinal metaplasia, uh, which is basically the presence of goblet cells uh, in the bladder. And this can be absolutely florid, uh, but uh, it is benign and there is no increased risk of cancer. Again, on the histology side of things here, we have our normal urethelium. And then you can see all of this is a glandular a metaplastic process uh, with lots and lots of goblet cells. And that is intestinal metaplasia. Non-keratinizing squamous metaplasia can be seen in many, many bladders and is completely benign. Looks like small little pink uh, bumps on cystoscopy. A lot of times seen in the trigone and bladder neck area in women. Uh, and there's no risk of developing a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is a benign thing, just leave it alone. Keratinizing squamous metaplasia, on the other hand, is a very, very bad thing. Um, this arises from chronic uh, irritation and inflammation and is associated with concurrent or subsequent development of squamous cell carcinoma. You can see the um, keratin here uh, on the top, and here we have our uh, squamous epithelium uh, underneath. Nephrogenic adenoma is another benign uh, entity that you can commonly uh, find in the bladder and actually can concur it can occur anywhere in the urinary tract. And what's happening is the uh, cells from the uh, kidney are being shed into the urinary tract and transplanting themselves into the bladder or other areas in the urethelium and then uh, growing uh, structures uh, that you would normally uh, see in the uh, renal cortical tissue. So these um, proliferations of um, basically uh, renal cortical cells um, can have many different looks. They can be flat, uh, papillary, or polypoid. Uh, many times uh, patients uh, present with gross hematuria, uh, frequency, or dysuria. And what allows uh, those um, cells to plant themselves and grow within the urethelium uh, is chronic irritation or inflammation that breaks down the bladder epithelium and that allows those kidney cells to take hold and uh, grow in the compromised um, bladder. Uh, these, uh, although they're benign, they're, they can have um, high recurrence rate and um, the best way to deal with them is just to do a complete resection and follow the patient closely. This is the histology of nephrogenic adenoma. As I said, it had many looks. This is one look where you just see a lot of little tubular structures uh, within the lamina propria of the bladder. And you can see all the associated inflammation. Here's a little cluster of plasma cells, but there are also eosinophils, I can, can see up here, as well as uh, neutrophils and lymphocytes.
So again, here on the left, we have our little tubules. So this is a nephrogenic adenome with tubules. Uh, meanwhile, on the right, here is a more uh, papillary nephrogenic adenoma. And it also has some tubules uh, here in the lamina propria. And when these um, benign proliferations uh, of kidney cells um, become papillary, they can actually mimic um, urothelial carcinomas. Schistosomiasis is uh, something you definitely have to know about. Um, this is a uh, parasitic uh, infection, and um, what happens is that the uh, eggs of this parasite wind up getting deposited in the urinary tract, and that causes a lot of inflammation. And the chronic inflammation uh, leads to the development of squamous cell carcinoma. In addition, the eggs wind up calcifying, which can then lead to massive calcification of the uh, urinary uh, system and um, cause uh, the inability of um, the uh, bladder to contract or the ureter to peristalse um, appropriately. This is what the uh, calcification looks like on imaging. You can see all this white here within the bladder, and that's all uh, calcified bladder wall, as well as uh, calcifications uh, within the ureter. Notice the ureters are also uh, dilated. So we have ureterone nephrosis. Again, this is because the uh, urinary tract, uh, due to the calcifications, is not able to uh, function appropriately. Here we have a slide showing the histology of schistosomiasis. The black arrow is pointing to an egg. So there's an egg here. We also have eggs here and here and here. Uh, here is some of our uh, urothelium that has some reactive change to it uh, just because you have inflammatory cells that are crawling through the urothelium. And you can see the massive amount of uh, inflammatory cells that are surrounding these eggs. Notice all of the eosinophils, all these little pink guys, and eosinophilic infiltrates are oftentimes seen in parasitic infections. Malacoplakia can uh, be commonly seen in the bladder. It can occur in other um, organs as well. And what happens here is this is an acquired defect in um, phagocytic um, function of the macrophages. Uh, and so um, normally it happens uh, in the setting of chronic bacterial infection with either E. coli or Proteus. And um, the um, phagosomes wind up just being absolutely stuffed full of um, bacterial uh, debris. And um, grossly, this looks like soft yellow um, plaques uh, within um, the bladder. Uh, what we see on histology is a bunch of um, pink cells, um, that, that which are the uh, macrophages, just um, full of tons and tons um, of cytoplasm. Um, so basically every pink cell you see here, um, the, these are all macrophages. And we have the classic finding in malacoplakia are these targetoid um, uh, little concretions that are inside of the macrophages, and these are called Michaelis Gutman bodies. And um, if you stain them, they will stain for both iron and uh, calcium. And uh, once you see one, you can see uh, that there are many of them uh, just throughout the entire bladder. Okay, now we're moving on to the uh, malignant bladder. This is a uh, gross photograph of a um, uh, cystectomy specimen. Again, we have um, the probes through uh, the ureteral orifices and all of this uh, papillary uh, exophytic uh, protruding structures, uh, that is all um, papillary urothelial carcinoma. Now, uh, bladder cancer uh, makes up approximately 70 uh, sorry, 7% of cancers in the United States. It's more commonly seen in males, and the most common presenting symptom is painless uh, hematuria, uh, basically seeing blood uh, in the urine. Um, urothelial tumors are the most common type. Um, about half of patients will present with tumor already involving the muscularis propria, i.e. the detrusor muscle at the time of diagnosis, meaning that the treatment for those patients is to have their bladders surgically uh, removed. 
and um, this is a very um, a, a aggressive type of tumor. And in fact, for patients who present with muscle invasive disease, the five-year mortality is 30%. Um, so it's important to remember when thinking about risk factors for bladder cancer uh, that the bladder is basically like a cauldron full of uh, potion, which basically means that when a carcinogen gets into the urine, the entire surface of the bladder is being exposed at the same time. And this causes what is called a field effect, meaning that you can have multifocal tumors arising at the same time because you have multiple different cells that have been exposed to the risk factor. The most um, common risk factor and significant risk factor in bladder cancer is, of course, uh, tobacco use, um, cigarette smoking. Um, however, exposure to um, uh, uh, industrial uh, chemicals has also been associated uh, with the formation of bladder cancer. We discussed how schistosomiasis uh, can increase the risk uh, of bladder cancer. Um, so it's not just carcinogens, but it's also chronic um, long-term inflammation uh, and irritation to the bladder. Um, in addition, there are um, drugs and treatments um, for cancer um, that can be a uh, increased risk um, for bladder cancer. So um, although it's nice um, to uh, have these uh, drugs and therapies um, available, the fact is that um, all things uh, come with side effects. Um, and so cyclophosphamide uh, radiation therapy, which is commonly used in the treatment of prostate cancer, as well as long-term use of analgesics is associated uh, with uh, bladder cancer. We'll talk very briefly about the uh, genetics behind um, bladder cancer. Uh, Low-grade uh, papillary tumors have been associated with gains of function in FGFR3 and HRAS, as well as uh, deletions on chromosome 9, um, while uh, high-grade tumors um, have been associated uh, with loss of P53, as well as loss of RB. BCG is something you need to know about because it is the uh, most uh, common and effective treatment for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, so a uh, tumor that has either not invaded into the lamina propria or has invaded into the lamina propria but has not invaded the muscularis uh, propria. And what BCG is is an attenuated mycobacterium, and it uh, is a given to patients as an intravesical installation, meaning uh, it's, it's mixed in with fluid, and that fluid is put into the bladder. The patients hold it uh, within the bladder uh, for a period of time, uh, and this causes a massive inflammatory reaction to the bacterium, and in the process, uh, the cancer is killed off. There are two different types of precursor lesions uh, seen in the bladder. These are precursor lesions to invasive urothelial tumors, and they include the uh, papillary uh, tumors, uh, which um, are exophytic uh, projections that have um, tumor cells lining a fibrovascular core. And then there is the uh, flat uh, lesions, which are known as carcinoma in situ. So there are different types of uh, papillary lesions, uh, ranging from the papilloma, which is benign, all the way up to high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, which has a very high risk of progression to invasion. But before we look at the histology, I think it's important to think of papillary lesions in terms of hot dogs. Stay with me. So hot dogs can be sliced in two different ways. Um, they can be sliced lengthwise, right? Uh, and they can also be sliced into these nice chokeable uh, little um, circles. And this is important because when we look at papillary lesions under the microscope, those papillary lesions are also getting cut in different directions. And so you will see that depending on whether they were um, cut lengthwise or widthwise um, is going to give them a different look. 
this is what um, papillary urothelial uh, carcinomas uh, look like when you're uh, looking on cystoscopy into the bladder. And they look a little bit uh, like sea anemones, but um, you can see how they're exophytic and growing um, outward uh, from the bladder wall. Okay, as promised, here we have uh, the histology. Now, uh, notice that this papillary lesion has been cut like the circle uh, approach of cutting a hot dog. So what we have is the fibrovascular core is in the center and the tumor cells are around the fibrovascular core. Now, this is a papilloma. This is a benign lesion. And basically, it has normal urethelium that basically happens to be papillary tends to be seen in younger patients. And you can see that the nuclei are lining up very nicely. They have great polarity, just like in the picket fence. And you can see the umbrella cells um, sitting on top. So this urethelium looks perfectly normal. It just happens to be papillary. Okay, in this histologic image, we see that the um, papillary structure uh, has been cut um, in a lengthwise uh, fashion. And so you have the fibrovascular core here again in the middle, and you have your tumor cells that are aligning it. And again, this is a papilloma, and so the urethelium is going to look completely normal. There's not going to be atypia, mitosis, and it will be a normal thickness. The papillary urethelial neoplasm of low malignant potential looks a lot like a papilloma, and that is because, uh, again, the urethelium is completely normal. It's just thicker than it should be. So basically, uh, if you have a papillary structure and the urethelium looks completely normal, but it's just too thick, and that's a papillary urethelial neoplasm of low malignant potential. Um, the vast majority of these will never progress or recur, but there's a small proportion uh, that at will, and that's why they're called of low malignant potential. This is a closer histologic view of our pun lump, again showing uh, very good um, polarity and no atypia, no mitoses. Uh, it's just that this urethelium is uh, thicker than it should be. The normal urethelium is, you know, anywhere, uh, it's around five uh, cells thick. And if you can count from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, this is about nine or 10 cells thick. So that puts it into the pun lump category. So uh, this is a um, low power histologic uh, view of our low grade uh, papillary urethelial carcinoma. Uh, now, uh, you can see in this picture, the tumor has been cut in two ways. Some of these structures have a lengthwise uh, cut. Again, fibrovascular core here, tumor cells are lining the outside. Others have been uh, cut uh, like little circles uh, in a different direction. And so then you have the fibrovascular core in the middle and the tumor cells are uh, lining at the outside. Um, <clears throat> now these uh, tumors, uh, tend to recur and they can progress to high grade uh, tumors. Um, but, you know, um, generally speaking, uh, when you have a low-grade papillary urethelial carcinoma, the treatment is just uh, to resect it and then just have the patient come back every three months and, and rescope and just see if it has come back. And many of them uh, will be cured. Now, the low-grade papillary urethelial carcinomas um, tend to maintain uh, somewhat appropriate um, polarity, but you can see that there is cytologic atypia, meaning that the nuclei are bigger uh, and darker um, than uh, they should be. Um, so this is a malignant uh, neoplasm. It is a precursor lesion, and it can progress uh, to high, higher grade or you know high grade uh, papillary urethelial carcinoma. Um, these basically almost never invade uh, as low grade tumors. Here we have a high-grade papillary urethelial carcinoma, and immediately you can see that um, this is darker uh, than the previous pictures, and that is because uh, there's a higher nuclear to cytoplasmic uh, ratio. Uh, this tumor um, will not have any uh, 
polarity, there will be mitoses, and the, the tumor cells will be very pleomorphic, meaning that they all have different sizes and shapes. And the high-grade non-invasive papillary urothelial carcinomas have a high risk of progression to invasive disease. This is a closer view of a high-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. Um, again, we can see that we have lost our polarity and we have, uh, so basically the nuclei are no longer lining up. They're just all over the place and on their sides. Um, we have mitoses and we also have excellent pleomorphism. So we have uh, nuclei of different sizes and, and shapes uh, scattered uh, throughout. And again, uh, these tumors have a high recurrence rate and a high progression to invasive uh, cancer. So in case uh, you are confused about a high grade versus low grade tumors, this is what they look like side by side. The uh, low grade urothelial carcinomas um, do maintain somewhat appropriate polarity, so the nuclei line up better. Um, however, there is cytologic atypia, meaning that the nuclei don't look normal. They're larger and darker than they should be. Uh, in contrast, we have a high grade lesion over here where you can see loss of polarity and uh, gigantic uh, nuclei and lots of pleomorphism. What is the difference? The difference is that the high-grade tumors um, are of a higher uh, recurrence rate um, and much more likely to in, uh, progress to invasive disease, while the low-grade tumors can progress to high-grade tumors, uh, they almost never uh, invade um, by themselves. So both of them are cancer. They're both evil. It's just the degree of evil. So now that we've covered all of our papillary uh, lesions, precursor lesions, let's talk about the flat uh, precursor lesion, which is called carcinoma in situ. This is urothelial carcinoma in situ. And um, what this is, is basically high grade uh, changes within the urothelium that just is flat. Um, so you're going to have mitoses, you're going to have uh, lots of pleomorphism and loss of polarity, basically the same uh, changes that we were seeing in our high grade papillary tumors. It's just flat. Um, now here we can see the distinction between the normal urothelium here on the right, where the nuclei are thin and they're uh, lined up beautifully and polarized, and we have the umbrella cells on the top, while here we have a transition to urothelial carcinoma in situ, where we have lost our polarity, and the nuclei are much, much larger and um, very pleomorphic. This is another histologic image of urothelial carcinoma in situ. Again, you see the loss of polarity and the significant pleomorphism. Um, but notice this is a flat lesion. Also notice it has not invaded. Here we have an excellent basement membrane um, showing that this is just a flat lesion. Here underneath is the lamina propria, so this is not invaded. However, this is malignant and it has a high rate of progression to invasive cancer as well as high rates of recurrence. Carcinoma in situ, just like papillary tumors, can be multifocal, and the treatment is the same. Basically, you use uh, intravesical therapy. I think at a medical a student level, you don't need to memorize uh, the staging. This is just to give you an idea of what staging is, which basically the higher the stage, the deeper uh, and more extensive the spread of the tumor, and this is really a, a general concept that applies to most cancers, which is that don't confuse stage with grade. Grade is how bad the tumor looks, right? Uh, tumors can be low grade, they can be high grade. Um, if they're low grade, they don't look so bad. If they're high grade, they look bad. Uh, stage is how far they've spread. So when uh, urothelial carcinoma invades, it invades as small nests and individual cells uh, that infiltrate downward um, from the urothelial surface. So 
um, up here is our surface uh, urethelium. You can see there's a little papillary lesion up here. And then all these small little nests, those are all of our invasive tumor. Now notice that this tumor is only into the lamina propria. We don't see large muscle bundles. So this would be what a T1 tumor looks like. Okay, here's our next stage, which is uh, T2, which is tumor involving the muscularis propria. So we have uh, these large uh, muscle bundles uh, of the detrusor muscle, the muscularis propria, and then we have these small nests of cancer cells that are invading the muscle. You can see them here, 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 this, this, this guy here. Uh, these are our tumor cells. Okay, moving on to stage T3, which is tumor involving fat. So these um, big white spaces, those are our fat cells. And you can see that some of them are lined by these um, flat uh, nuclei at the edges. Um, so that's uh, fat. And then our tumor uh, are all these pleomorphic uh, cells with abundant pink cytoplasm uh, infiltrating uh, through the fat. Okay, so we've covered the benign lesions, we've covered our uh, malignant uh, bladder, we've looked at precursor lesions uh, to invasive urethelial carcinoma, we've looked at invasive urethelial carcinoma, but wait, there's more. That's right, folks, there are variants. Variants, why? Because life is variable. That's right. In the bladder, urethelial carcinoma is the most common tumor, but we also have our second most common tumor, which is squamous cell carcinoma. In other countries, this is very commonly associated with schistosomiasis. Here in the United States, it's associated with chronic irritation and inflammatory conditions such as neurogenic bladder, chronic indwelling Foley catheters, stones, and chronic urinary tract infection. Small cell carcinoma can also arise in the bladder, although it's very rare. It looks exactly like small cell carcinoma of the lung. Uh, it has a very poor prognosis. It's a very aggressive tumor. What's interesting is uh, in about half of these cases, you will also see uh, your typical urethelial carcinoma. And so it is thought that uh, the small cell carcinoma in the bladder is actually a de-differentiation of your classic urethelial carcinoma. This is what it looks like. So here we can see the distinction between small cell carcinoma versus urethelial carcinoma. So these pink nests here on the left, this is your classic urethelial carcinoma that likes to invade as nests in individual cells. And you have pleomorphic nuclei and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. As uh, on contrast, we have all these uh, blue cells with an incredibly high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio with uh, lots of mitoses and apoptosis and this is our small cell component. So adenocarcinomas can occur in the bladder, although they're very rare. So most of the time when you see an adenocarcinoma in the bladder, you think, oh, is this a prostatic adenocarcinoma that has eaten its way into the bladder or a rectal adenocarcinoma that's eaten its way into the bladder, which is much more common. Um, but rarely adenocarcinomas can be seen arising from the bladder. Um, they look identical to adenocarcinoma seen anywhere else in the GI tract. And um, most of them come from uh, uracal rectum. Remnants. Okay, now comes the fun part, the Patronus, the pop quiz. We'll see if you guys have been paying attention. Okay, so here we have a bladder. This is urethelium. And on the right side, we have our normal urethelium. And then we have this abrupt transition to the cells that are very pleomorphic um, and have lost their polarity. And so, and this is flat. And so this is carcinoma in situ. Okay, next we have uh, all these uh, cells with uh, lots and lots and lots of pink cytoplasm. And then we have these uh, perfectly round uh, targetoid uh, concretions. And um, this is Michaelis Gutman bodies. And so your diagnosis is malacoplakia.
Okay, next we uh, see urothelium um, on the top. We uh, see a lot of pleomorphic cells, lots of um, mitotic figures. And then uh, down here in the lamina propria, we see these small nests of um, atypical cells going into and through the lamina propria, uh, occasional uh, individual cells. And so the diagnosis here is invasive urothelial carcinoma. Okay, now we have um, this lesion. Uh, on the surface, we have normal looking urothelium. The nuclei are very small. There's good polarity. We have umbrella cells sitting on the top. And then we have some von Bruns nests. And some of these von Bruns nests have developed cystic uh, spaces in the center here. And so this is cystitis cystica et glandularis. This is another lesion of the bladder. Uh, we see lots of these little tubules uh, with bland looking nuclei that are kind of flat to cuboidal. Um, and uh, here's another uh, more dilated uh, tubule here. And the diagnosis is nephrogenic adenoma. Here we have a papillary structure. The nuclei are small and thin. There's good polarity. There's nice uh, umbrella cells on the surface. The thickness is normal. So this is a papilloma. Here we have a uh, tumor uh, that is invading uh, into the lamina propria. Um, we see a lot of pink cytoplasms, a lot of uh, pleomorphism. There's mitotic uh, figures uh, and atypical mitotic figures scattered around. And what you see here in the center is a calcified schistosomiasis egg. And so this is squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, here's our last one. We have urothelium. Uh, and uh, the nuclei are relatively well polarized. They're maybe a little rounder, maybe a little bigger, but what's going on here? It looks like ants are crawling through our urothelium. So these are a whole bunch of neutrophils that are uh, going through the surface here. And so these are all reactive changes. So this is acute cystitis. Thank you for joining us for the Hogwarts edition of Bladder Pathology.